All right, welcome everyone. So today we're going to be talking about systems genetics. So that basically means taking genetics to the systems level, to the whole genome level. And uh, up until now, we've really been focusing on uh, genome-wide association studies. We've been focusing on um, uh, annotations and how they overlap. And yes, this was at the level of the whole genome. But then after we found enrichment, we went back down to individual regions. And then we used these enrichments as priors to then prioritize SNPs in individual regions. So the model that we still had was one where we are focusing in on an individual region at a time and then studying disease through that context. Today, we're flipping that on its side and we're basically saying, let's instead study genetic associations with disease at the whole systems level. And that's where questions of heritability, polygenicity, pleiotropy, and so on uh, come in, okay? So this is the end of the uh, module on genetics. So basically this is population genetics and disease genomics. Next week, we're starting a new module on comparative genomics and phylogenomics and evolution. So um, we are now culminating what we started out as just observing variation to then how does that variation relate with uh, disease? And then what are the intermediate quantitative traits that mediate the effect of those genetic variants and disease. And now we're basically going to look at whole genome associations. Who's with me so far? Awesome. All right. So what we're going to do is start by defining heritability, by sort of explaining the relationship between genotype and phenotype in a systematic way, and then how we can use that to understand the genetic architecture of complex traits. We're going to develop polygenic risk scores, linear mixed models, partitioning of that heritability, looking at polygenic and omnigenic models of disease, and then uh, looking beyond genetic architecture to really the systems biology view of disease, and also phenotype prediction. Basically, how can we use this polygenicity and these many, many different loci to start predicting risk at the, inter uh, at the individual level, okay? So what are some of the key lessons that we've learned from GWAS? Number one, we found a lot. <laughs> and that's what we should be celebrating. There are 120,000 regions of the genome that are statistically significantly, after bone for and correction, associated with disease. That's a big deal. Basically, it tells us that something goes on in 120,000 places, each associated with a specific phenotype. Of course, the challenge is interpretation. But what else have we learned? We've basically learned that we haven't even begun to close the loop on GWAS. That basically, that um, you know, tail of a discovery is extremely long. And the more individuals we're finding, the more individuals we're profiling, the more low side we're gonna be prof uh, finding, okay? So part of the challenge is that the known low side exp explain very little of the phenotypic variance. And today we're gonna develop a mathematical toolkit to be able to uh, explain that systematically. We've also seen that uh, most of the loci, in fact, affect transcriptional regulation. They do not tag coding variation. They mostly tag gene regulatory circuitry. And that's where sort of the system's biology of gene regulation and all of these regulatory genomics techniques that we've learned and all of these epigenomic techniques for annotating regulatory elements in different cell types, that's where they will become super relevant in being able to understand what, what, what do all these regions mean. So that's the goal for today. First, we're going to talk about heritability. Then we're going to talk about a polygenic risk scores. How can I infer the score of a person using thousands of loci? Then we're going to get into disease architecture. How is a particular disease, you know, uh, organized? Is it a small number of strong variants? Is it a very large number of weak variants? What does the distribution of effect sizes and frequencies look like? Then we're going to introduce a very powerful technique of linear mixed models which enable you to capture um, genome-wide associations in a, in a very um, uh, systematic way. And then we're gonna look at how we can partition heritability into different functional categories. And then a very powerful method for doing that, that exploits the intrinsic principles of the LD patterns, the linkage to equilibrium patterns that we talked about uh, on the first lecture of this module. And then lastly, uh, polygenicity and omnigenicity. Ready with me? All right, so what is uh, determining phenotype? 
phenotype, or P, is determined to a big chunk by genetic and to another big chunk by environment. So this is super easy. P equals G plus E. Everybody with me? So basically your phenotype is determined both by what your parents gave you as alleles, but also what your parents gave you as nutrients and shelter and, I don't know, lack of radioactive uh, <laughs> or, uh, exposure and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is basically P equals G plus E, um, you know, the most foundational. And then we want to know not just what is your phenotype, but how does phenotype vary across individuals? Sure, we're going to be talking about the variance of phenotype. So the variance of phenotype is basically determined by the variance in genotype plus the variance in environment, plus the covariance between genetics and environment. Okay? And if we assume that there's no gene-environment interactions, then we're going to be talking about the phenotypic variance and how much of that phenotypic variance is driven by genetics or by environment. And for different traits, this will be differing greatly. For some traits, there's a huge component by genetics and environment plays very little role. For others, environment is a big driver. So for example, if you look at obesity, environment is a huge driver. If you look at schizophrenia, it appears that, a genetics, that genetics is a huge driver. So we're gonna be talking about heritability as basically the fraction of the phenotype that I can explain genetically, okay? So if a trait is very heritable, it means that the stuff that I can explain by genetics captures a big chunk of what, what phenotypic variation I can see. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Awesome. Uh, you had a question? Great. Other questions? Okay. So uh, if I only have one causal variant, and it's basically, you know, zero, one, or two with some dithering. Then there's three possible genetic values in the population, zero, one, or two. And the intuition is that the variation in the phenotype is how much of that overall variation I can explain simply by the genotype. Okay? And if these uh, distributions were very tight around that line, heritability would be one. But any kind of deviation from that red line is environment. Raise your hand if this makes total sense. Great. Any questions so far? Yeah. So you're plotting with a single genetic value if that's going to work with? Yeah. So yeah. So how do you know that that variance in the genotype is different from the other profile? So suppose that your genome only has one variant. Okay. <laughs> so this is the simple case. Of course, uh, you know, we're about to leave that simple case very short in a second. Any other questions? Okay, so that's, that's just very simple intuition. Basically, if I know the genotype, how much of the phenotype can I predict? With one variant, it's that regression, and then whatever deviation remains, that's the residual variation, and that's basically the environmental component. Sounds good? So now we can basically start splitting up uh, this, so basically V of G is the variance of the mean phenotype across different genetic values, and V of E is the variance of the phenotype for the same genetic value, okay? So V of G is what is the mean difference between this, and then V of E is what is the residual difference after I take care of that, okay? All right, so we can actually start partitioning now this V of G part. So the part that is explained by genetics, because there's all kinds of genetic things that could be explaining it. There could be common variants and rare variants. There could be additive effects and interaction effects, dominance and recessivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start splitting up the genetic variant uh, variation uh, component further. So we're going to be defining uh, V of G as having an additive component, a dominance component, and an interaction component. The additive component is just a linear model, basically saying how many bad alleles do I, do I have, how much badness do I have in my phenotype. Okay. Sounds good? So it's basically just an additive, how many bad you know, mutations did I inherit? How many risk mutations did I inherit? Or how many tall mutations did I inherit? And so on and so forth. So if every genetic variant is pushing me towards some score for increased predisposition to, be, to being tall, this basically says how far down am I pushed based on the genetic alleles that I inherited? And this basically says how tall am I? Everybody with me so far? Great. So the added component is just a linear model. And as we add more causal variants, the phenotypes become closer and closer to Gaussian. And that was a big 
shift from the Mendelian way of thinking of one trade at a time to the Fisherian way of, of thinking of many Mendelian alleles, uh, ma many Mendelian loci together appear to be a continuous distribution. Okay? And we could of course further decompose the interactions. We could include variants due to the novel mutations, rare mutations, and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's very easy to think about this whole thing as, you know, sort of a glass half full kind of thing. So um, how much of the phenotypic variants do I capture with different components? First of all, with all of the genetic variants, and then decomposing that into an interaction term, a dominance term, and an additive term. Okay. So now we're going to be defining different types of different uh, types of heritability. We're going to define broad sense heritability as capital H square, which is simply the entire genetic component divided by the phenotypic variance. Okay. And broad sense basically captures every single genetic factor. And then we're going to also define narrow sense heritability, which is simply based on the additive component. So little h square is the additive component divided by the full phenotypic component. Uh, variation. Okay, so narrow sense captures only additive effects, and of course, there's continued debate as to how much does dominance or interaction play a role in this overall genetic variability. Yeah. So how can you link the variants that we have to heritability when you that link? So we haven't yet linked them. We're about to. Basically, we're gonna, we're about to sort of look at the relationship between the genetic variants that we're discovering from GWAS and being actually able to predict phenotypic variants. So the variants that can explain genetically is we will find out how much of that we can capture with common variants, with rare variants, etc. So we're going to estimate these numbers. Basically right now this is just definitions, but we're now going to estimate these numbers by sort of looking at data and what are the different lines of evidence that we can use to estimate heritability. Does that answer your question? So what, what do you mean by heritability? So heritability basically means what fraction of the difference in height in this classroom can I explain based on the genetics of these individuals in the classroom. So when you're born, if you take the average height of your parents, it's a pretty good estimate for what your height will be. So basically, if you have a very, very tall dad and a very, very short mom, chances are you're going to be closer to the middle. If you have two very, very tall parents, you know, holy gee, you're going to be a very tall person. Like, that is heritability. That basically says that I know before the baby even shows up that this baby is going to be tall just by looking at the parents. That basically says that knowing that that kid inherited genetic variation from its parents tells me a lot about the future phenotype of the kid. That means high heritability. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, keep going through that. You could more easily buy one probably. Um, okay, who's with me so far? Awesome. All right, so then the question is why even bother studying heritability? So the first uh, reason is that it allows us to quantify the importance of genetics versus environment for our trade of interest. If we know that schizophrenia has a very small genetic component but is increasing in the population, we have to figure out what, it co what causes it. If we know that, for example, obesity has a very small genetic component but a big environmental component, then you know, we have to intervene somehow and so on and so forth. Okay? It also teaches us about genetic architecture. How many causal variants there might be? What are their effect sizes? What are their allele frequencies? And that's important in basically understanding the population risk, understanding for each individual, what should I be looking at in order to predict their phenotype? Should I be looking at common variants, rare variants? How well would I be able to predict their phenotype if I know all this information? And now narrow sense heritability is also the fundamental parameter that we need for phenotype prediction. And it is the theoretically best possible prediction performance with a linear model. So it basically says, how well could I potentially do after I'm done discovering all of the millions of genetic variants that contribute to that trait. Now let's get to actually estimating heritability. So going back to this, you know, phenotype is genetics plus environment. And we can now start asking about the 
correlation between pairs of individuals in their phenotype and the correlation between pairs of individuals in their genotype. And heritability is nothing more than the relationship between the two, okay? So heritability basically tells me how much can I predict re, um, similarity in phenotype if I know similarity in genotype? If two individuals are 100% genetically identical and I find them to be 100% phenotypically identical, then I know that my heritability is 100%. Okay? If two individuals are 50% identical and I predict 50% identical, again, heritability is 100%. Everybody with me so far? So that's sort of a very easy definition of heritability, basically saying, how much of my genetic relatedness enables me to predict, how much my genetic relatedness enables me to predict my phenotypic relatedness. So heritability relates phenotypic correlations to genotypic correlations. And if two individuals have the same allele at each of the uh, causal variants, they will have the same phenotype. And that's what's kind of cool. We're, we're talking here about causal variants. So if two individuals share their entire genome, then of course they're also gonna share all of the causal variants for that trait. But it is possible that if I knew exactly what are the causal variants for the trait, if there are say four of them, I can basically find individuals that are 100% sharing the causal variants. Everybody with me here? And that's gonna become very important when we start partitioning heritability. We're basically gonna say, let's partition heritability into all of the genetic variants that act in brain and all of the, the genetic variants that act in liver. And then my genetic similarity in brain might be a better predictor of phenotypic similarity for schizophrenia than my genetic similarity in liver, okay? And that will basically tell me that the brain component of that heritability, if I partition it into a liver component and a brain component, that the brain component captures more heritability than the liver component. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome, great. So the fact that I can compute the genetic similarity matrix on different portions of the genome is gonna be something that we're gonna use throughout this lecture. You basically argue for polygenicity, argue for disease architecture, argue for um, causal pathways and so on. Everybody with me? Awesome. So this is simply known as the Heisman elston regression. Basically, you just fit a linear regression of phenotypic correlations against genotypic correlations. And that regression simply gives you heritability. So the ratio between the two gives you heritability. This was initially developed for identity by descent. In other words, related individuals um, would have, you know, 50% uh, or a quarter or an eighth of their genome based on how distant the cousins are and then looking at the phenotypic relationship between them. And again, going back to this regression here, this is super simple. You basically ask, great, I don't have one genetic variant anymore. I now have you know, millions of genetic variants, but if I share zero, uh, you know, if I share 100%, 50%, 25%, et cetera, what is the correlation of phenotypic sharing? That immediately gives me heritability. That's what's kind of cool. I can basically ask, how similar are cousins? How similar are siblings? How similar are parents and children? And that gives me heritability. Everybody can see that? Because I know the genetic similarity between them. So we can derive genotypic correlations from a family. For example, monozygotic and gaudy twins are 100%. Siblings share 50%. And when you use that approach, you basically find that height has a heritability of 73%. That basically means that 73%, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, 73 of the phenotypic variation in height can be explained by genetics. Everybody with me? Who's super comfortable so far? Awesome, great. Um, so now we can basically ask, great, here's our additive component of the maximum that we could potentially explain using this additive model. Let's ask, what fraction of that can I actually explain based on the genome-wide significant hits, right? So I can basically say, I have some linear model that predicts my genotype component by taking the identity of all of my alleles and multiplying each of them by the effect size of that allele, okay? 
So it's a product of a bunch of betas and how much each of them is contributing to my genotypic variance. Who's with me so far? Great. So we can estimate the effect of the SNP uh, you know, beta from genome association studies. And the variance explained by each SNP depends on both the effect size and the minor allele frequency. A SNP could have a huge effect size, but it's very rare in the population. It doesn't explain that much of the phenotypic variance in the population. Okay. So then I can start explaining this variance in this component here. And if we do that with the genome-wide significant SNPs, what we usually find is that with 250,000 individuals, we find 700 genome-wide significant loci for height. The last one is explaining less than a tenth of a millimeter in height. It's statistically significant, it's there, but it's tiny. It's less than the difference between when you wake up in the morning and when we go, go to bed at night. I mean, just, just to give you a sense of how small these effects are. But we have 700 significant uh, loci. So the question is, well, how many more loci are there and how much phenotypic variance could they explain? The answer is probably lots of loci. And in terms of phenotypic variance, it's probably still very little because you're still adding up all these tiny submillimeter effects. So then you can ask, great, we probably have close to that thing, right? Close to all of the phenotypic effects that we could explain by genetics. So let's add it up. What do we find? <laughs> the answer is totally um, anticlimactic. It's 16% uh, compared to 73% for uh, the overall genetic similarity of identical twins, okay? This is a big problem, a very big problem, and it's known as the missing heritability problem. In other words, if GWAS is so great, why aren't we explaining the additive component of heritability that we would expect? Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Awesome, great. These are just the frequencies of the different SNPs. Everybody with me? Yeah. So when people uh, build these models back up, uh, these models, it's the gene identity. Yeah. Sorry, uh, gene by environment interaction. Yeah. Uh, how, how is the heritability problem manifest? Yeah. So what's really interesting here is that here we're even talking about just the narrow sense heritability. That's excluding dominance, that's excluding interactions, that's excluding G by E, that's excluding, you know, all of these other things that we don't really know how to model. But even from those, there's a very small component that we can explain with GWAS. Yeah. Everybody with me here? So then the question is, um, what gives? <clears throat> you know, something must be going on. And people have been basically debating a lot, why isn't this higher? Why isn't this lower? <laughs> and why is um, V of um, G so far up compared to what we can explain? <coughs> and there's many hypotheses that uh, the community has raised. One is that, yes, yes, my last variant associated with height is, you know, submillimeter. But if I, have, if I have another million of those, that's a lot of submillimeters added up. So suppose that they're all one tenth of a millimeter and I have a thousand of them, I'm doing great. Basically, I can explain a lot more of the variability. And this is turning out to be uh, one of the possibilities that there are unobserved rare variants of large effects. So what could be going on? Whenever I find a genetic variant here that is associated with my trait, there might be some rare variant nearby that perfectly explains the trait. But that rare variant is only captured, is only um, uh, found in one out of 100 individuals that carry that haplotype. This is gonna look like a tiny little association with this common variant, but it might actually be a hugely strong association with that rare variant. Raise your hands if you're with me on that. Awesome. Uh, and also our model assumptions might simply be incorrect. We may be, you know, all, all this. And each of those has very big implications for the future of human genetics. What should we be doing next? Should we be sequencing whole genomes 
across tens of thousands of individuals? Should we be genotyping common variants across millions of individuals? Depending on sort of that answer, the strategy for finding, you know, the missing heritability is completely different. Everybody with me on heritability? So the second um, sort of system genetics topic that is uh, very, very important to, to understand is polygenic risk scores. Namely, how can I predict the risk of a person from a small or very large number of genetic variants? So basically the, the idea is, can I estimate the absolute risk of each individual by combining both genetic and environmental risk factors? So this is, you know, for example, your lifetime absolute risk of breast cancer. And this is, you know, um, individuals who have very high risk, moderate risk, and very low risk. So this is distribution across the, the population of risk. And the question is, what pushes you to uh, be high risk? You know, what is the component of environment? What is the component of genetics? So the idea here is let's calculate a polygenic risk, risk score, which basically means I'm going to use many loci to calculate a risk score for each individual. And basically, this is simply summing up across all SNPs over which I'm computing this polygenic score, the betas plus the identity of the genotype for each individual. Okay, so if this risk allele increases uh, by, you know, um, some, I don't know, going back to height by 0 0.1 millimeters for every height uh, associated, you know, tall associated allele, then I'm just summing up all of these contributions times the number of alleles that I have at every locus. Raise your hands if you're with me on this. Awesome. So we could simply sum this up and do this over all of the SNPs, okay? We basically have this, you know, tiny, tiny, you know, uh, effect tail, and we could just sum them all up. And then the, the question is, you know, can we really do, get an accurate portrayal of height from that? And the answer is that, unfortunately, the estimates, the error bars on those genome-wide significant loci are larger than the effect sizes as you get further and further in the tail. So it's very difficult to, to obtain accurate polygenic risk scores by estimating the maximum likelihood estimate of every beta. So we're going to have to deal with the uncertainty of all these betas, and we're going to see how we can do that. You could also just select the genome-wide significant SNPs, and then the problem there is that you explain a very small chunk of your overall genetic heritability. You could go below, but then you're uncertain, you're uncertain, and you could also ask, uh, you know, at, at what point do I deviate from this brand? So there are many ways to address these challenges. One of them is to basically, uh, you know, uh, threshold the p-value. To basically say, oh, I'm only going to use SNPs that are above a certain cutoff. And then after I've chosen that cutoff, I'm going to also LD prune. What's LD pruning? LD pruning is basically saying, if I have a causal variant here, which is associated with a bunch of other potentially causal variants or a bunch of other associated variants, after I've already accounted for the first one, all of the other ones have very reduced effects, sometimes zero effects. So basically pruning is one technique for uh, removing anything that is co-inherited with that genetic variant. Raise your hands if you're with me on pruning. Perfect. So you could basically build your uh, score by, you know, summing up all of the variants up until genomic significance threshold or well, well below genomic significance threshold. And up until genomic significance threshold is unfortunately capturing a tiny fraction of the variance. So you really do want to go below that. So, and then of course you could ask for a bunch of phenotyped individuals that were not part, of course, of my discovery cohort. What is the actual height of these people? And what is the predicted height of these people? And you can build a, you know, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, or AURC, to basically see how much predictive power do I have for predicting that somebody has cancer or somebody is really tall and so on and so forth. Everybody with me? So the problem with using all the SNPs is that there's a D between them and we have to adjust for the spurious weak effects. So one way to do that is to throw away all of the neighboring SNPs 
Another way, which is a little fancier, is to decorrelate them. So basically in every LD block, I have a bunch of potentially correlated SNPs, or actually not potentially, of observably correlated SNPs. So what I can do is principal components. Basically take all of the SNPs in that locus and just do PC1, PC2, PC3, and just select a number of PCs which are now orthogonal to each other and therefore capture that residual for every one of these loci. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome, great. So uh, the Shemil Sh Sh Shanyev's group published, uh, I mean, posted a paper in BioArchive uh, that sort of does that uh, just a few months ago. Um, and then when you do these polygenic risk scores, you can basically say, what is my ability to capture, uh, to predict basically rheumatoid arthritis or celiac disease or myocardial infraction or coronary artery disease by adding more and more SNPs at lower and lower frequency, okay? So as you include more SNPs in the risk score, the association actually gets stronger. So your overall ability to predict the phenotype is getting stronger. And then at some point, it kind of falls off. And this is simply because at that range, we simply don't have cohorts that are large enough to discover those SNPs reliably. So there's a much greater error. I don't know if you guys remember when we looked at the ability to reproduce a QTL effect, discovered with very few individuals, were abysmal, was abysmal. And in the same way, with relatively small cohorts and very rare variants, these estimates are very uh, weak, very uncertain. But you can see here that this predictive ability very often increases as I go down to more and more uh, included SNPs. Okay, everybody with me? So we talked about heritability, we talked about polygenic risk scores. Let's now see how the two together can help us understand disease architecture. And in particular, we're gonna use that trick that we discussed earlier of partitioning heritability. We're basically gonna say, how much heritability do I have for different portions of the genome? And one way, very simple way of partitioning the genome is by chromosome. So how much heritability do I have in chromosome one, in chromosome two, in chromosome three, chromosome four, chromosome five, chromosome six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera. What do you notice here? Yeah, so the chromosomes are in order. You basically are explaining more and more variants with the first chromosomes in the list. And in human, the first chromosomes happen to be the bigger chromosomes. I mean, you've all seen this picture of GWAS that I showed you, where you basically go from very big chromosomes to very little chromosomes. So you can see here is chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, four, five, six, seven, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? The reason for this is because uh, linkage groups, uh, you know, where, anyway, basically genetics in human um, was a little slower. So by the time we knew the uh, linkage groups that sort of put all these markers together, we kind of already knew the chromosome sizes. If you look at the yeast, chromosomes are in random order of height and the reason for that, of, of length, and the reason for that is that uh, linkage groups precede uh, chromosomal uh, boundaries. But anyway, what's really cool here is that the longer the chromosome, the more variance it captures. What does that tell you? This is really weird, right? It basically appears that variance, that genetic heritability, is partitioned almost equally, sprinkled across the entire genome. That basically, you know, if I have a big garden, the more garden I have, the more heritability I capture. That's like grass, it's not like trees, right? Like, it's everywhere. It's not just like big chunks of heritability sitting on different chromosomes. Who gets what's happening here? So basically, when I look at relatedness, when I basically partition heritability, when I look at these genotype over, basically genotype similarity versus phenotype similarity to get the H square in, in between, and I calculate the genetic similarity only on certain portions of the genome, the larger the portion, the more heritability I get. It's quite mind-boggling. Um, and that suggests that causal variants are actually spread uniformly across the genome. And you can do that down to a one megabase interval. And you can basically ask, 
how much heritability do I capture in different megabase intervals for different traits? And if you look at this lipidemia, there are some one megabase chunks that capture a big, big chunk of the heritability. If you look at hypertension, there are, you know, fewer super tall peaks, but still many, many chunks. And if you look at schizophrenia, almost every location in the genome explains some non-random heritability. So most of the genome explains non-zero heritability. Again, this is just mind boggling. I mean, there are review papers and there are mission statements sent to senators and to congressmen that basically say, we're gonna find a few genes associated with schizophrenia. <laughs> and the answer is, whoa, there are thousands of them. The, you know, the smaller the, the, the chunks of the genome, the, the more, uh, you know, the, you know, if you continue finding them with even tiny chunks. Who's disturbed by this? You <laughs> shouldn't be disturbed by this. Um, and that's sort of, I mean, there's reviews like by Goldstein, for example, that says, well, if genetics points at everything, it points at nothing. Like the fact that you can sort of say, and this, and this, and this, and this, like, you know, uh, I'm going to quote a great movie, very intellectual, of The Incredibles. I don't know if you remember that scene where he says, and when everyone is special, no one will be. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you guys remember. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if everyone is special, no one will be. I mean, this is, this is you know, nothing manifests more uh, visibly a schizophrenic individual than this schizophrenia association here. Um, everybody with me? Awesome. So um, now the question is, embracing that dramatic polygenicity, how do we go about... Uh, you know, selecting the locations that we're going to use in our uh, polygenic risk scores and, you know, what does that tell us about disease architecture? So the first is, you know, directly fitting the underlying linear model is actually ill-posed because we have so many different loci and very, very few individuals. We have millions of loci, but in our association studies, we only have hundreds of thousands of individuals at best. So it, it is under constraint. And then the idea is that we're going to instead use these spike and slab prior to force many effects to be exactly uh, zero and basically regularize the problem and arrive at a solution that simply has fewer parameters. And the goal will be to estimate the effect sizes and the level of sparsity jointly that will basically tell us about the overall heritability. The other idea is to start partitioning the genome by pathways and then asking, how much heritability is localized in different pathways. And that's very powerful because even if there are a thousand, uh, if there, even if there are sort of, you know, 3,000 regions that are all associated with disease, maybe that association will be localized within these regions, more specifically within particular pathways. And this is indeed what you see, that basically depending on um, the disease that you're looking at, very different pathways are in fact uh, associated with that disease. Another way to get at disease heritability is to actually simulate what kind of genome-wide association study result distributions we would expect for different types of architectures. So you can basically simulate uh, different numbers of causal loci, different heritability, different prevalence, different strength of selection, and then carry out a virtual GWAS with each forward simulation, and then ask how much do the parameters that I see in fact fit the observations that I see from GWAS. And what you can see is that some of them are consistent with the data, with those you can't say anything, but other architectures are completely inconsistent with the data. They predict too many associated loci at this p-value. They predict um, too strong of a distribution of effect sizes that's skewed uh, differently than what you actually observe. So only some architectures are in fact consistent with the observed data. So you can actually start saying, well, this trait is probably not very strongly selected and the number of low size selected is probably not, you know, very large and so on and so forth. Okay. So um, we talked about how to estimate heritability based on uh, sharing by descent. And we also talked about how to estimate heritability based on sharing by state. There's two different concepts here. One is identity by descent, which basically says we're cousins, we're third cousins, we're tenth cousins, and so on and so forth. That's still relatedness. 
and that's filled by descent. Basically, there's a recent common ancestor that sort of gave rise to the shared heritability. Whereas identity by state says that two random individuals in this room share, I don't know, a thousand different SNPs. Okay. Um, something that you can do to get closer to capturing the rare variants is to infer by the identity by this, uh, to infer identity by, this, by descent through identity by state. So what you basically can do is take unrelated individuals and ask how many of their alleles do they share in a particular haplotype. And if they share many alleles in that haplotype, that suggests that they're sharing the whole haplotype. Everybody with me? So basically, you can get at segments that were inherited rather than SNPs that were inherited. And if you get segments that were inherited, you can actually say that, well, I'm now capturing not just the common variants in those segments, but also the rare variants in those segments, because I've inherited that whole segment. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. So you can basically do that, and then um, the, what you can do is infer shared segments, and that allows you to capture rarer variants much more efficiently than simply looking at LD. And that allows you to now start asking, well, how much more heritability do I capture using shared segments rather than shared SNPs? And the answer is that it actually increases uh, substantially uh, using, um, you know, up until some point, and then there's no further capture. So basically that result suggests that perhaps it is not the super rare variants, but it is all the way down to the low frequency in the rare, but not the very rare. Sounds good? So you can basically see here that it increases when you get down to one in a hundred, but then it doesn't go, it doesn't further increase below that. And then for the, you know, very rare, you just don't have any additional uh, contribution. Is everybody with me so far? So again, all of these things tell you a lot about uh, disease architecture. So the next topic that is extremely important in sort of the systems level genetics is uh, linear mixed models. And they're really a power horse of uh, genetics, but also of many other fields uh, in sort of machine learning and uh, estimation. So what is a, a linear mixed model? Uh, so a linear model is simply a model that allows you to predict phenotype based on genotype and some effects. Uh, in the parameter state, okay? So basically, for every SNP in the genome, I, I have some coefficient with which that SNP is contributing to disease, and then I can predict, you know, disease across many, many individuals. So for any one individual, I basically have their genotype matrix, which I then multiply by the coefficient matrix. And then for the next individual, I can predict their phenotype by multiplying their entire genotype matrix by the exact same parameters, okay? That's what's important here, the fact that we have a set of thetas that we've learned from genomic association studies, namely what is the beta, what is the uh, effect size of every SNP in the genome, and now I can apply that theta uh, for every location in the genome, so theta one across all of those, theta two across all of those, and so, and so forth, uh, to basically predict the phenotype of each individual. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So we can basically talk about these phenotype matrix as a function of the genotype matrix and the parameters, plus some random noise that is basically, you know, distributed uh, as, a, as a Gaussian. Sounds good? Everybody with me? So, and then the effect size itself could be sampled by some normal prior that uh, has a meta parameter up there. So, the problem here is that Right now, we're basically saying that noise in this linear model, we're saying that noise is independent between individuals. That if you're more related, that has no effect on whatever is not explained genetically. But the problem is that this is not the case. The problem is that the, there's an additional component which is dependent on your relatedness. And part of that is shared environment. Part of that is rare variants. Part of that is socioeconomic status. Part of that is ancestry. 
So when we talk about this linear model, we want to also include a term that captures whatever uh, additional effect is not driven by this independent model of every SNP contributing in an additive fashion, but is instead driven by some global measure of relatedness. So, yeah, so, so this is simply asking how, how many of your genotypes do you share? So this K related this matrix is just your kinship. It's basically, you know, amount of relatedness. Does that answer your question? So it's basically, again, 100 for like one uh, for identical twins, 50 for siblings, and so on and so forth. Everybody with me? Great. So in GWAS, the most influential uh, random effects stem from some kind of population structure. And that population structure is directly captured in that kinship matrix. So that, that's exactly what linear mixed models do. They basically say there's a fixed component, which is directly implied by my genetics. And then there's a random component, which is in, in, inferred from my kinship matrix. Raise your hands if you're with me on that. Awesome. So, uh, you know, the reason for this is that some unknown population structure might be influencing many SNPs and then phenotypic variation that's both due to population structure and the actual association is inferred from that. So basically the Bayesian approach to account for this random effect U is to uh, average out this uncertainty, to basically integrate over this uncertainty, uh, you know, according to that probability of this noise model, okay? So if, what you're left with is a residual error that is both uh, this IID error where every individual is uh, independent and identically distributed and some kinship component of that error. Everybody with me? So that's what basically linear mixed models do. So basically the idea is that you're gonna be expressing your phenotype as a function of both this um, you know, um, fixed model and this random model. And under this infinitesimal assumption where all of your betas go down that very, very long tail according to some uh, distribution of heritability, some normal distribution, which is simply the heritability divided by the number of uh, genetic contributors, um, you can basically estimate that using this residual maximum likelihood. And what is residual maximum likelihood? It basically avoids using the maximum likelihood fit for the parameter, instead uses transformed data so that those nuisance parameters, in fact, have no effect. And in this uh, variance component analysis under this random effects model, this transformation focuses on the deltas, on the differences, on the sum of the variances, rather than the actual uh, values. So, and then this works despite not knowing what the causal variance might be. So for example, for height, you can in fact infer uh, this overall H squared G, which comes from the entire genome, even though you don't actually have the betas for the entire genome. You can basically directly apply that using your kinship matrix uh, rather than understanding what is the contribution of every variant in isolation. You can basically say, the more sharing I have, the more I can um, explain of that heritability. Okay? And that's this um, regression that we talked about earlier between phenotypic correlation and genetic similarity. This is, you know, phenotype correlation versus genetic correlation, PCGC. So this is the same thing that we previously called this Haysman Elston regression. Uh, it's also known as PCGC. Okay. So we talked about heritability, we talked about polygenic risk scores, disease architecture, and linear mixed models. Let's now talk about partitioning that heritability into different components. Okay. So the limitation of heritability is that um, simply explaining all of the heritability in the complex trait is not enough. As the sample goes to infinity, the entire genome will eventually be associated with all traits. And the goal is instead to find what are the biological pathways that are recurrently disrupted uh, instead. And one way to do that 
is to basically start asking about enrichment as I go down my rank list of all um, SNPs. So I can basically rank um, all of my SNPs by their GWASP value and then say, okay, great. These are the genome-wide significant ones. They're at 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus eight. And then I get into sub-threshold SNPs. And then I get into sort of really, really shaky territory of nominal p-value of 10 to the minus three. Remember, five times 10 to the minus eight was our genome-wide significance threshold. This is 10,000 times less likely. And I can go down to 0 0.01. <laughs> Basically, no one in their right mind would look there. But here's what's really phenomenal. If you look at, for example, QRS duration, which is a heart regularization interval between the Q landmark, the R, and the S landmark, QRS regularization duration uh, is very strongly associated with this purple annotation, which are all DNA accessible sites in the left ventricle of the heart. And what's really remarkable is that as you go down this association p-value threshold to less and less significant loci, they continue to preferentially localize within enhancers that are biologically relevant. This is very weird. It basically says that, yes, even though you shouldn't believe any individual genetic variant below this threshold, as a group, they're still very meaningful at the pathway level. Raise your hand if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So weakly associated variants overlap accessible chromatin much more than expected by chance. And the same trend observed in genome-wide significant uh, variants is also observed in sub threshold variants. And that's also found for DNA accessibility, for TCM peaks, for chromatin MM segments, for enhancer clusters, and so on and so forth. So you can basically start combining these genetic variants across many different loci and prioritizing these annotations that explain the most heritability and then select variants within these annotations first as you go down your list. You can basically use a penalized stepwise regression to select relevant annotations and then use approximate space factors to compute the posterior probability of annotation using these empirically estimated priors from those enrichments and then add more and more annotations until they don't add any more variants and then remove the annotations from the fitted model until the variance drops too much. And that basically allows you to then select a set of annotations for your genome that best explain you know, uh, your, your phenotype. So for example, if you look at HDL cholesterol, you basically can ask uh, what are these annotations that are the most important, both positive and negative. And for example, hep G2, hepatic uh, cell lines, appear to be the most informative. And then you have intestine, and then you have you know, uh, other cell types that are all relevant to uh, liver and digestive organs and so, so forth. So you can basically you know, see how this allows you to now start partitioning SNPs into those pathways, selecting the most interesting pathways first, and then sort of pruning them out. You can do the same thing to now ask about different classes of annotations. You can basically say, how much more heritability do I capture if I only focus on coding regions? If I only focus on untranslated regions that are transcribed but not translated? If I only focus on promoter regions? If I only focus on intronic or intergenic regions? And then the dotted line for each of those is how much you would expect by chance based on what fraction of the genome do they cover? Again, we saw that we could start partitioning the genome randomly into one megabase segments. And therefore, if a chromosome is longer, you would expect it to have more heritability capture. with me on that? In the same way, you could basically say, well, hey, intergenic regions capture 50% of the genome, so I would expect them to have 50% heritability. But if they have more than that, or less than that, I'm going to get excited because basically we'll say that there's more heritability sitting in these regions than I would have expected. And the elephant in the room is obviously DNA hypersensitive sites. These are high resolution annotations of places where the chromatin is accessible and therefore where transcription factors are binding. And those places, you would only expect them to cover about 19% of the genome and therefore 19% of the heritability, but they cover 80% of the heritability. Okay, so there's a fourfold increase in 
how much uh, heritability they capture compared to the landscape or to the to the real estate that they capture in the genome. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So accessible chromatin explains way more heritability than you would expect. And if you combine the DNA hypersensitive sites in more than 100 different cell types, more than 70% of the genome is accessible. But in any one cell type, only 16% of the genome is accessible. And yet, they capture a big, big chunk of the heritability. So that implies that non-coding SNPs explain way more variance than uh, per SNP than coding SNPs. Okay. All right. So up until now, we've been partitioning heritability by sort of saying, you know, let's chop up the genome and take that genetic relatedness matrix and compute it only in different subsets of the genome. Everybody with me on that? So now let's look at a slightly more sophisticated way of uh, doing this. And uh, this exploits some underlying properties of these linkage to equilibrium blocks that we talked about. So assume that causal variants are drawn uniformly at random from the genome, right? Causal variants are sprinkled throughout the genome randomly. Everybody with me with this assumption? So then what happens if a genetic variant that's causal falls here? Then it, when I carry out my genome-wide association study, what am I gonna see? I'm gonna see that, yes, this genetic variant is uh, associated, but so is this one and that 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 one. And so is every single one of them in this entire LD block. Everybody with me on this? So conversely, if I'm randomly sampling um, SNPs based on uh, my genotyping array and a truly causal SNP that's not on my array falls in a larger haplotype block, in a la larger linkage to equilibrium block, then I'm gonna be much more likely to capture it because there will be so many more variants that are tagging it. And conversely, for a small block, if, it, if it, the true causal variant is coming from a small block, I'm gonna have fewer opportunities of capturing it. Raise your hands if you're with, if you're with me. Awesome. So again, the causal variants are drawn uniformly at random from the genome, and they're much more likely to come from larger linkage to secular root blocks. So that basically means that the expected, um, you know, score that I would get is uh, directly proportional to this LJ, which is the total LD score of J. So what's the LD score of J? So for every SNP, it's simply the sum of all of the SNPs nearby that are correlated with them. Okay? So basically, for every uh, SNP, I'm going to be basically summing up these uh, correlations. The more correlations I have, the stronger my LD score. Everybody with me here? So basically, I'm summing. For every J, I'm summing this R squared, which is the correlation of that SNP across individuals in my population with all of the K SNPs in that same LD block. And the SNPs that have the more correlation will have a stronger LD score. Everybody with me on LD score right now? So um, this is you know, the first intuition. So basically you can do now uh, and this is this number here. Lj is simply the sum of all of my R squares between J and any other K in the same LD block. N is the total number of SNPs in my genome. M is the total number of causal SNPs. And now, if these causal variants are drawn uniformly at random from the genome, I would expect that the uh, overall uh, risk for my particular trait is simply the number of SNPs times the LD score of every variant times the heritability overall divided by the number of causal SNPs. And that's where it gets kind of cool because I can basically infer heritability by regressing out the LD score versus the summary statistic that I obtain 
from my GWAS chi-square test, okay? So I can basically um, write out this uh, expected value of the chi-square statistic. This is the chi-square statistic that went into this formula of the number of degrees of freedom that eventually allowed us to calculate the p-value of association for every SNF. Everybody remember that part of the chi-square test? Great. So instead of calculating this chi-square p-value, which is actually very hard to calculate the moment you're starting to look at a very large number of contributing uh, variants, because you don't only have you not only have one variant at a time, you're now doing a multivariate regression with many many different genetic variants, and basically doing the chi-square calculation there to obtain a p-value is actually pretty computationally expensive. Instead, you can simply look at the chi-square statistic directly. And that chi-square statistic is directly related to the sum of these R squares for your J and for all of your Ks nearby, all of the SNPs in the same block, okay? And basically what LD score regression allows you to do is estimate heritability simply by taking the ratio between your chi-square statistic and your LD score, okay? Because the higher the LD score, the more, uh, so, so your overall heritability is simply the ratio between the two, okay? Raise your hands if you're with me here, perfect. So LD score is simply the sum of all the other R squares for every J. LD score regression is the ratio between this chi-square statistic and this LD score. So you're regressing out the relationship between your um, chi-square statistic and your um, uh, overall um, RJK R square sum, okay? The overall LD score. And that's what's really, uh, you know, very powerful here. The fact that I can basically start estimating heritability as uh, the, you know, how much of the uh, causal SNPs I've captured by looking at the relatedness between the chi-square statistic and the overall uh, LD score for every SNP. Okay, so that basically allows me to estimate, uh, you know, some heritability component for every one of these uh, SNPs. Sounds good. And that's what's really kind of cool, because now, instead of looking at this LD score across all of the SNPs in my uh, LD interval, I'm going to only look at the LD score summed over all of the SNPs that fall in a particular <coughs> annotation. Okay? So now, for every J, for every SNP J, I'm going to sum over all the Ks that fall in the annotation of interest. And that basically gives me, just based on the, related, the, the relationship between this chi-square statistic and this overall sum of correlations of this overall LD score of every SNP, where I can now partition this LD score, I can basically do stratification of this LD score according to different annotation classes. And this is what you get when you do that. If you basically take genetic associations with schizophrenia and you ask, what is my LD score regression stratified by different types of epigenomic annotations, straight from the Roadmap of Epigenomics project, for example, that we saw in the epigenomics lecture, then you basically find that this LD score regression is highest for genetic variants that fall in central nervous system. If you look at height, you basically find this connective tissue and bone, as well as cardiovascular. If you look at BMI, you basically find that there's these, you know, um, adrenal uh, component and this brain component. If you look at uh, HDL cholesterol, you basically see that the biggest contribution is from liver and from other tissues. If you look at whether somebody smokes or the number of years of education, you basically see that it localizes again in the central nervous system. Everybody with me? So we can basically use these partitioning of SNPs into different functional categories combined with this correlation between the overall chi-square statistic and the sum of correlations of SNPs in an LD block known as LD score, 
to basically, you know, infer heritability directly without actually going through the beta estimation and then partition that heritability by function one. Everybody with me on LD score regression and stratified LD score regression? Great. The last concept is that of polygenicity. So basically how polygenic is um, disease really? And the fact that enrichments continue to be significant at different p-value thresholds tells me that there's something going on there, but it doesn't tell me how many of those loci are in fact containing additional SNPs. It just says that there's something there. Um, whereas what you could do instead is actually look at every SNP individually going all the way down the rank list, not just by p-value where the, there's more and more SNPs accumulating at these low p-values, but stretching them out for each SNP, okay? So you can basically use functional enrichment to gain insight into the genetic architecture by considering more and more SNPs below this genome-wide significance threshold and asking if the regulatory regions that they fall into enabling us to enable us to prioritize SNPs further out the rank list. So if you took a, a notation that is not related to your phenotype of interest, what you end up with is the blue line that basically just randomly fluctuates up and down the line. That basically says, what is the deviation from what I would have expected to what I observed? And then that just kind of falls along the line. But if you take uh, for an immune trait, genetic variants that fall in um, T cells and B cells, what you see is this dramatic deviation for uh, quite a while, and then eventually falling back down because they all have to fall back down to no enrichment. And what's really remarkable here is the actual values of the x-axis. There are 1.7 million SNPs that continue to localize within these enriched annotations. And the enrichment continues to increase for 1.7 million SNPs. I mean, this is uh, just extraordinary. And this argues for extreme polygenicity. And it's the same thing you see for many different traits. If you look at schizophrenia, you basically see here that brain is very strongly enriched for again, thousands of lo independent loci in the genome. If you look at several immune traits, like Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes, uh, even Alzheimer's disease, you basically see that immune cells are very strongly enriched. And if you look at uh, uh, sort of coronary artery disease, you see that it is instead heart and that all of those enrichments continue across thousands of loci. Everybody with me here? What you can also do is instead of asking for individual um, uh, tissues, you could basically look at modules the same way that we looked at enhancers that are coactive, that are turning on and off at the same time. You could basically build modules of common activity. And what you find is that uh, you know, these modules continue to in fact capture more and more of that um, of those of those SNPs as you go down the rank list. And then what you can do is start understanding what are the pathways that these are implicating. So you can basically link enhancers to predicted downstream target genes and then ask, are those target genes enriched in common pathways? And indeed what you're finding is that there are hundreds of enriched pathways for many of these uh, traits. So basically, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, each of those traits, you basically see that for schizophrenia, it's dendritic spine development. For type 1 diabetes, it's the major histocompatibility complex. For pneumatory arthritis, it's uh, the NF-kappa-B pathway. For Crohn's disease, it's T-cell proliferation. For coronary artery disease, it's cholesterol uh, metabolism and triglyceride metabolism. For, uh, you know, each of these traits, you can basically see a lot of uh, relevant uh, pathways that continue to, to be implicated. And these basically implicate many, many novel genes uh, in those enriched pathways. You can also ask not only what are the downstream target genes, but also who are the upstream regulators that are responsible here. And you can basically find that for each of those traits, different sets of regulators appear to be governing the enhancers that are all turning up for the same SNPs. Everybody with me? So you can basically look at the motifs within them and then predict who are the upstream regulators, and again, find a lot of consistencies. And then from these 
uh, regulators, you can actually start painting the disease networks that are associated with different ones of those diseases, color each of the genes according to the traits that they're associated with, and then build the interaction network of sort of how are they uh, showing up. And then the combination of upstream regulators, in fact, allows you to predict what cell type each of those will be acting. So observing all that, there are many uh, implications. So one implication is that there are truly thousands and thousands of loci across many different pathways that are continuing to come up uh, in disease. So Jonathan Pritchard and Alan Boyle and others have basically now uh, brought forward this concept of beyond polygenicity, of omnigenicity. And basically the idea is that um, there's this widespread signal of association which is falling across many different functional annotations that as you increase uh, the fraction of the genome that you're looking at, you're continuing to find more and more of these SNPs and that these p-values replicate all the way down to you know, almost no uh, significance and uh, that these very broad uh, functional terms, these genontology terms that have thousands of uh, genes are continuing to come up as significant. It's not just that they have thousands of genes, it's that they're consistently enriched in these complex traits. And if you look at these genontology categories, they're all sitting above the diagonal. Very few are you know, on the diagonal. They're either enriched or depleted, suggesting that nearly every gene ontology term is involved in many of these traits that they've been looking at. And the model that they're building is that, yes, indeed, there's a core set of genes and pathways that is, you know, very strongly associated with a very specific set of disorders. But then as you look at the regulatory network inside the cell and the protein-protein interaction network and the functional interaction network, um, you basically see that more and more of uh, the periphery is starting to get involved and they're still enriched. And the reason for that is that they're interacting with someone who is then interacting with someone who is then interacting with someone who then is interacting with one of the core genes. So, you know, manipulating almost anything inside, you know, uh, any pathway will eventually have some connection that then dysregulates calcium channels and eventually, you know, is associated with schizophrenia. So that's sort of the model that they've come up with. There's a lot of controversy in the field as to whether we should embrace this model or not. Uh, some criticism is that they only looked at a small number of traits and that they only looked at <laughs> overall enrichment without actually trying to cluster them. If instead you try to cluster these pathways and you try to cluster these traits, you find more of a diagonal line that basically says, yes, sure, there's weak enrichment across the board, but that enrichment is truly picking up a, a, a distinct set of pathways for each distinct trait. Everybody with me so far? So what did we talk about? We talked about heritability, this dramatically important concept. We talked about polygenic risk scores. We talked about <laughs> disease architecture, linear mixed models, how to partition heritability, how to uh, understand the relationship between the chi-square statistic and the overall LD score through this LD score regression, and how you can use that to then start partition heritability uh, in, a, in a different way, and then this dramatic uh, polygenicity. Who feels that they've learned stuff? Yay. Um, cool. So this is the last lecture in this uh, area. On Tuesday, we're starting a new module on comparative genomics and evolution. Okay? Great. See you guys on Tuesday.